Welcome, everyone. Uh, just to make sure you're on the right spot, Inball is giving the design talk. Uh, Evicha is giving a parallels talk. This is neither of those. This will be a case study. So um, we're going to be being restful with million, billions of dollars in transactions with C++ and JSON and HTTP. Um, so I'm Kevin. Uh, I've been doing technology for you know 30 years or so. Uh, network engineer, online gaming, casino online gaming, not, not World of Warcraft online gaming. Um, in the last 20 years, I've been doing more financial modeling and in the last seven, credit card processing. Uh, that's my current in incarnation. Um, I work for a company called Electronic Payment in Exchange in the US. Uh, we are what they call a acquiring processor. It's a little bit different because we actually talk to Visa, MasterCard, American Express, and banks, uh, including the National Reserve. We help move the money around. Um, and so the talk I'm going to give is a case study of how we use these particular header-only libraries uh, for JSON and C++ HTTP lib uh, for making RESTful interfaces that our systems get uh, spoken to by credit card machines and and other clients. So a little bit about credit card transactions, just as a background. Uh, if we look at the top of this graph here, we have web terminals, physical terminals, and APIs. And in a way, you know, when you tap your card, it's actually going through that terminal and talking to an API. So in the end, the APIs receive most all the data. Uh, this is what we say is coming in from merchants. So when you go buy your coffee, you tap your card, that transaction comes in, they call that an authorization. So the first time the transaction comes through, it's you know your $5 for your coffee. Later on during the day or sometimes the evening, they'll turn around and settle those out. That's the other side over there where you see settlement. So this is just a kind of an overview of what the credit card transactions look like. Uh, it's a lot more in-depth process than some people think. Um, but just as a little bit of background. So all the demo code that I'm going to show is based on credit card transactions and such because that's my day job. Um, there will be source code available. You can download and play with it, etc. All right, so we'll do a little bit of history. We'll talk about RESTful APIs, uh, architecture, REST calls. Um, then we'll look at the JSON and HTTP libraries and, and how we use them in C++. All right, so I know it's still morning. How many of you know CRUD? Create, read, update, delete, OK? What about the HTTP verbs that go with them? Yeah, OK, so if we have a get, we're going to be doing what? Read, OK? And so a post is going to be a create, right? And then put. OK? And of course, that makes the last one easy because a delete's a delete, right? <laughs> All right. So REST is representational, representational state transfer. Uh, Roy Fielding uh, wrote about it in his dissertation. And the link's there if you end up wanting to read the dissertation. There's a lot more to it than just REST. Um, but that's one of the main things that he has in there. Um, a REST interface has six constraints. It should be client-server should be a uniform interface, stateless, um, cacheable, layered system, and the code on demand. The code on demand is kind of an optional one. Um, and so we'll, we'll get to that. So let's look at constraints for clients. So as I was saying, from our perspective, um, we have web interface type clients, you know, which is going to be your basic web page. If you were ordering something from Amazon, you're using that on your phone. But then the other half of the clients are your terminals. And interestingly enough, you know, we have terminals that talk to us in XML. We have terminals that talk to us in, in EBCDEC and all kinds of different things. Um, <coughs> but there's a reason why we're moving to JSON. And so having a consistent interface, you know, if we have a create operation, we're going to be doing a post. And we're going to turn around and post to a URI, right, or a URL. We want that uniform resource in, uh, interface. And so if we did a create, if we're creating a record with a post to a sale, we'd pass it a JSON payload. 
we'd expect it to create a record. If we wanted to read something, again, we're going to do a get, pass in the URI. And in this case, I'm trying to point out the fact that you might pass a value in on that URI. So like I was giving the example of uh, you're buying your coffee during the day. So as you're doing things during the day, the transaction might be uh, set with a batch ID. And so if I did a get with this batch and a batch ID, I would expect to get back whatever transactions were attached to that. So we're not going to necessarily have a payload, but we would probably expect a response back from a get. Um, put, so in this case, I'm saying if I wanted to void a transaction, I might pass in a transaction ID. Um, there may be a payload with that because I'm trying to do an update on any particular <coughs> records. Uh, just to say, if you hear me swap the words transaction ID, GUID, or brick, they are kind of interchangeable. Um, they're just a unique ID. Um, and then delete. So if we did a delete on a sale with a transaction ID, we'd expect it to delete it. Um, part of the thing that you're doing in a JSON is your HTTP result codes are as much part of the response as whatever payload you're getting back. So in the case where here, I'm showing 405 not allowed because generally speaking, at least in my business, if somebody puts in a credit card tra transaction, we don't ever allow you to delete it. You know, that, that generally wouldn't be a good thing. You might be able to avoid a transaction, but we don't end up deleting data. So we don't use it, but in the demo code that I provide, I do show using a delete, and so you'll be able to see how that's done too. All right, so server constraints. Um, hardware, database, basic point of a server. Uh, we'll look more at the uniform interface. So on the server side, we're going to want to have endpoints that are consistent and help define what the interface is. So, you know, as we were saying before, if we did a git with a sale, particular GUID uh, or brick, we would expect probably to have any transaction that matched that unique identifier to come back. If we post a sale, we're doing a create, we're going to expect that that endpoint is going to create an object somewhere inside our system. Uh, same thing with a put doing an update. Again, trying to point out that when we're using REST interfaces, it's not just about the endpoint as in, you know, we don't put everything in the payload. You might actually put part of that unique identifier in the URI so that when you're looking at the interface, you can tell based on the URI, based on the verb that you're using, what you expect it to do. All right, so just kind of giving another couple examples. Get on a refund, if we passed any unique ID, we'd expect to see either an answer coming back saying that yes, we did do a refund there, or perhaps an empty response, but you'd still get an okay so you know it wasn't found. All right, so REST interfaces should be stateless. Each one of these items should kind of be its own atomic operation. If I do a create, it's it. It, it creates that one record. That's that one operation. Now, I will say that in our own systems, we do sometimes add some session management on the server side, but we are sometimes doing that for security because we're trying to track some things coming through. Normally, any kind of state management, though, is handled on the client side, not on the server. So we want it to be cacheable. Um, so if you can imagine, uh, if we did a get to get a list of transactions, and if we didn't add any other transactions in between the time that we did the get, then we'd kind of want that data to cache. You know, it not, might not be us that's doing the caching. It might be another layer or system in between, because web, pa uh, web pages get cached. And so we want the data to be able to be cache cacheable. Um, layered system. I mean, you can kind of see that in the way that we've got this built, whether it's in the URIs uh, with how they operate or interoperate, or looking between the server, the database, and caching. And code on demand. So this is the optional one on REST. And code on demand is that you should be able to pass in, if you make a call, you should be able to pass back down binary data. So, this would be an interesting part where, you know, we don't actually use it, but I could actually look at having a credit card terminal be able to update itself just by making a REST call to an API. Um, but again, like I said, it's not something that we use, so it is there if you want to use it, um, but I, probably, I won't be covering that any, anymore. 
All right, so I'm going to go through and show some REST examples just so you can kind of get a sense of what I'm talking about. All right, so we'll do an example of a post transaction. So this is a very bare um, credit card data example that we'd have. So you'd have an account number, expiration date, an amount, a batch, ID number perhaps. You'd do the post, it'd be sent off to the server. Server would do its processing. We'd be checking with American Express, whoever, if it's good, and we'd pass back an approval. The thing I want to point out here is that there's two parts of this response coming back, right? We have our status of the HTTP code as well as the data, and not just, you know, so it's each one is part of your response. You have a 200 that's telling you that, yes, you know, you got a good response back. That 200 isn't necessarily saying something is approved. And what I mean by that is that um, the 200 is that the endpoint was good. Uh, maybe that's a better way to put that. Uh, let's look at another. So uh, we have a put transaction. So again here, if we look at the URI that I'm using, the idea is, is that we would have the unique transaction ID there at the end. So you notice that in the URI, it just looks like you know we have the domain sale. We're going to increment something, and then that unique ID. And I'll show this in the code. We'll see how this ends up working. But that's why, in this case, that unique ID would be the piece that's looked up. And so we're only going to pass in the amount that might be changing on this transaction. And so once again, we would end up sending that through. We would get our response back as whether or not it was approved. Question? Yeah, so that first, that first post, for example, would have returned back the unique ID. And then I would be able to later go ahead and use that unique ID to post something back. And so, again, however you make a REST interface, I'm giving the example of this is how we do it in our particular business. But, you know, when you're building things for whatever you want to use REST for, this is just to give you ideas of how you might be able to use it. Um, but the part with the unique ID there, you know, this is something in our business that's pretty common because, like I said, if you go to a restaurant, you put down your initial card, they come back and they say, do you want to add a tip? So when you gave them the card initially, that's that first post, okay? And then later on that night, they'll turn around and take whatever tip you put on, and that's when we would get the second request that would come in through the terminal system saying, hey, they updated the tip. And instead of sending the whole transaction again, we would only send the edits for the put. All right, so... All right, so one more. Um, if we were to delete a transaction, and you know, as I said, we don't use delete, uh, we're not actually sending a payload because this is one of those things that's kind of like a get. You wouldn't need the payload. Um, but in our case, this is where we would send back a different result code. We would actually give a 405 because at least for my API, this is a delete as a verb wouldn't be allowed. And so depending on how you build out your RESTful uh, interfaces, you know, that's again the idea that you can use status messages to your advantage. Um, previously, we used 0MQ. 0MQ uh, is a message queue passing system with JSON. Uh, I'll talk about that. Uh, we like header-only libraries at our company, and we'll see why. Uh, course performance considerations. And then the two libraries that I'm going to talk about specifically is uh, JSON for modern C++, which is by Niels Lohmann. Um, and of course, they're open source projects, so lots of contributors. And then CPP, HTTP, lib. And so we'll look at the pros and cons on them. All right, so JSON over XML. I'm sure most people won't be surprised by what this slide ends up showing. But you know, when you're looking at the two of these, at least for me, the JSON's easier to read. Not that I dislike XML. But if we take like the account number line, we have 43 characters versus 30 characters. So you know, you're, getting, you're getting some space savings. Uh, this card entry method line, 32 characters compared to 23. Overall, for this particular data set, 378 to 299, that's over 20% savings. Okay. 700 million transactions a year, that's a lot of space savings. And that doesn't count the thing of if you're looking at a credit card terminal that's maybe 
you know, being ran over a dial-up modem line because it's in a small town and you have latency and things like that. So there's other benefits. To um, so I gave a talk in 2018 that was about using zero MQ with financial transactions. Um, we do still use zero MQ, but we have, a, as we call our system a platform, we have like 70 or more little programs. And they all communicate their state, whether they're up, whether they're down. That's more of what we use zero MQ for. Uh, the talk, if you want to see it, is there. There's a GitHub for it. And the reason I put the GitHub is because part of the code that uh, I used when I did that initial talk is being used in the demo code that I have for this talk. And so uh, I'll cover that a bit more. Um, I, I had this thing about, you know, why JSON with REST, uh, you know, peanut butter and jelly. Now, uh, my, my daughter's boyfriend, he's from Costa Rica. He would never eat peanut butter, let alone with jelly. So I, that might be more to me. <laughs> All right, so why header only? Um, size matters. You know, we have a small team. And when you got a small team, the idea of pulling in and learning all of Boost, not that you know, Boost has great libraries, uh, it's just big. Um, so we like small header only things that are easy to follow. We like them to have minimal amount of dependencies. And really it comes down to can we maintain it ourselves? So for our company, there's risk if we're using an open source project that if that open source project's no longer maintained, what are we going to do? And so then it becomes, you know, our team then has to be the ones that end up maintaining that code. So when we started with uh, JSON for modern C++, uh, it was a tag 2.0. And at that point in time, it was 13,000 lines of code. If you pull it now, it's over 24,000 lines of code. Likewise with C++ HTTP lib, it was 3,000 lines of code and now it's over 9,000 lines of code. But I will say this for both of these libraries, um, they've just improved their quality. Like the amount of things that have been added to the JSON library, they've added the ability to pass binary through, um, it's become more conformant. Uh, same thing with the HTTP lib library, it's features that are being added, the same core reasons why they made the libraries to begin with are still being held to. And then on top of that, you know, since we started with them, we've grown with them, we have plenty of members of the team that can go through these files and maintain them or make customizations if we needed to. All right, so JSON for modern C++, JavaScript object, object notation. Uh, everyone here understands JSON well enough, I'm guessing, key value pairs. Any questions on JSON? All right, so why do we use it? Massive language support. Just about every language we can think of will pull JSON in. It's built into a lot of languages by default. Um, Niels Lohman, gentleman that uh, originally started the project, there's the URL for it. There is a benchmark called Native JSON Benchmark that compares the libraries. We're going to look at some of the a couple graphs from it. Um, Milo is the person that made this benchmark. What's interesting about that is that Milo makes Rapid JSON, which is a competing product. Um, I'm using the, the images we're going to look at are from the 2016 run. I did try to uh, rerun the benchmarks, but I had some problems on it. So that'll be something I'll have to compare later. Um, the only negative about uh, JSON is that you can't have comments. Um, there's no error handling. There isn't an actual date type, which can be problematic. Um, and some would say it's not as robust as XML. But given the choice between the two, I'll still pick JSON most days. OK, so when the 2016 benchmark was ran, uh, so as we can see here, rapid JSON you know, was at 100%. And the end loman was at 96%. I get that it says 96%, but there's never been a time that we've used the modern uh, JSON for modern C++ that we've ever had a conformance issue. Um, that isn't to say that there aren't edge cases, but again, that's where I'm saying I, I actually want to rerun this benchmark to see if it's still only at 96%. Uh, from a performance standpoint, rapid JSON is the fastest. Um, however, again, the Enloman library is not really that 
far off. And from our experience, it has not been a performance issue that, you know, uh, talking with a colleague of mine, there's been one application where we're like, well, we could use rapid JSON and it would probably speed things up a bit, but speed isn't the problem we have, and the usability and maintainability with the, this library in particular is, is easier for us. And as developers, I don't know about you, but I like reducing my cognitive load because we always seem to add more of it with new problems that come up. All right, so the other library we'll end up looking at uh, for building RESTful interfaces is handling the HTTP side. Um, so the header owner library that we use there is CPP HTTP lib. Um, there's the link for it. It is both a client and a server. Um, the only thing on the client side is it is blocking. So the client side of HTTP lib is not asynchronous. Um, that's not really a problem for us because we don't use the client side near as much. Uh, there are benchmarks. There's a benchmark project for it. Um, there isn't really anything that's pulled out of this benchmark that's surprising. This particular library is not meant for its speed. Uh, we knew that going into it, but it is easy, easy to use. So the HTTP lib does do SSL support. I am fortunate with the way our systems are designed that we have lots of load balancers and such in front of the code that I write. I don't have to deal with the SSL portion. Um, so it is pretty well documented. Uh, I was just looking at a, a pull request today where you can even do your certificates in memory without having to pull them from the drive. So there is good support for it, but I won't be covering it uh, anymore. And, and when I'm showing the demo app and code, it's, it's not in there. All right. Um, so the approach for the rest of the talk, uh, we're going to look at how we build out the basic HTTP server. We're going to look at the uh, REST practices. Um, and then to be able to test things out, we'll create an HTTP client. And then we'll talk about some of the lessons that we learned as we did it. So lots of code slides now. All right. So as I mentioned earlier, part of this is based on code that I have from a previous talk. And so um, I'll point that out as we're going on. I, I'd been told you know that you, you don't want to rush over slides or brush over information. And so I can't stress enough that all of the code, when we get to the end, I have the GitHub. You can pull it, build it on Mac or build it on Linux. I have not tested the build on Windows. Um, Fortunately, I kind of say. Not that I have anything wrong with Windows. I just don't build on it. Um, but you'll be able to look at all the code. But I want to get down to the meat of where we're making the RESTful interfaces, too. So we have an application class. It's called RESTful. And it inherits from this app class. The app class is one of those ones that I'm saying is a sporting, supporting scaffolding class. So like I said, we have like. 70 plus little applications that help run our platform. And so there's some things that we've done to make it consistent. And a lot of that comes down to loading a configuration file, reloading configuration files dynamically if we want, uh, you know, a basic logger that's available and all of that. And again, the code's in there. Um, I will say that the current code we're going to look at has had a little bit more clang tidy work than the stuff that's from 2018. So, you know, when you open up in clang tidy and there will be a slide later of a logger class that's got about 23 warnings or more on it, I just haven't gone back to clean that up in the demo code. It was cleaned up elsewhere. <laughs> All right. So now if you look at the orange arrow there, we're, we're looking at this restful.cpp file. Uh, we'll look down here at the bottom first with the main. Uh, so you can see that we're doing app main passing in the arguments, we pass in and create our uh, RESTful class. Now, there was an override for run, which then forces that RESTful run to go. RESTful run calls app run. App run is part of that scaffolding where it's actually going to look for, you know, if you see that we're passing an app name, an app name up there is RESTful. So kind of the format that we end up using, which is whatever the name of the binary is, it's going to actually look for a JSON file of the same binary name in the same folder. And that's just part of how we pull that together. Um, I'm going to skip over the start method that's right there and talk about the idle real quick. Uh, you'll notice that I have that const auto f name, which takes a log line. Uh, 
Clang tidy likes to give an error if we don't do a static const or a static cast on the underscore function. So some of this is a little bit of boilerplate to, to make things look nice. Uh, we have that idle time of five. And as you see here, all we're doing with this particular method is having it sleep for five seconds over and over and over again. And the reason we do that is so that it keeps the daemon running. And we'll see why in a minute. OK, so this is where we're starting the application up. Um, I put a snippet of what is inside of the RESTful.json. You'll see that we have a key of HTTP server, which has a structure underneath of it. So if we go down here, you can see we're doing the log line part. But the next part that's there is we have this structure or this object that is HTTP host. And we'll look at that in a minute. Host is being passed in this HTTP server tag. So that app colon colon get config dot at get config is actually returning a JSON object from Enloman. The dot at is then how you're accessing the particular keys that are underneath of it. And that's getting passed into that host setup, which we will look at here next. Uh, it's the OS stream here, we're just making some pretty strings uh, so that we can uh, you know, output some nice stuff. And then you see we start a standard, uh, we use std thread. And we're passing in this HTTP listener run. We move in our host object and then detach. Um, so part of the reason why we keep idle going is so that we can detach the thread and let it run in the background. Whenever it's not answering, it's going to turn around and just put in an idle line. In our particular work that we do, having that idle come through, we have a lot of parallel uh, data centers running. And there's times that we're moving traffic from one data center to another. And so we don't like logs to not be necessarily giving messages. So we always just keep an idle going. All right, so this is that struct of host. And here you can see there's really not much to it. We have a standard string of an IP, a port, um, and an unordered set for band IPs. If we look at the setup, you can see where we're passing in the JSON object as a config. And so IP gets set by doing config at IP. This is part of the reason why we like the nloman uh, library. It, it's pretty straightforward. You're just doing at and the key name, and it's going to find it and load it in there. Same thing with port. When we get to the if statement, we're doing a contains, um, because we're checking first to see if band IPs is even there. If it is, then you'll notice that we do config.value. And so the reason we're doing it this way is because we can take the band IPs, and if there's anything wrong there, it's going to at least default initialize to the unordered set. We also have that method in there that is is band. So you know, we're going to pass in an IP. It's going to give us true or false if it finds it. And we'll see where this gets used here in a little bit. All right. So in the couple slides back, we used that std thread. We were starting up HTTP listener run and moving in our host object. So here's run. You see that we're moving in the host object. And here is our first call to HTTP lib server. We're starting up the server object there. Uh, we're going to call this handler method, which we're going to pass the server. We're going to pass a reference of the server into, and we're passing in a reference to the host. And then we tell server to, to start up and listen on the IP and host. So this is that setup. Uh, so we have HTTP lib server there. Um, again, we're taking it as a reference. And we're making three other smaller calls, security, errors, and routing. And we're going to look at these uh, in a little bit of an opposite order. I want to start with the routing, because this is the part where I was saying we want to get down to how we're actually making our endpoints using the HTTP lib. So the parameters that you use for HTTP lib when you're, you'll notice first off that we have a method for each one of the verbs for post, put, get, and delete. I haven't done a lot with it in here, but there is actually another verb called options. Um, and HTTP lib even supports that, uh, which I think is supposed to be kind of a discovery uh, variable, uh, variation. The parameters for each of these is a pattern and a function pointer. And so we use a pattern and a lambda because the lambda is just nice and concise. We can see it right there. Uh, in this particular point, I'm doing a lot of const HTTP lib request with passing in the request or uh, taking the request reference, the response reference. But of course, 
you know, some people would say always auto, um, but for being able to show what was being passed in, I clearly tried to define it here. So we have our post, which is going to be for a sale. So if we were turning around and making a new transaction, we would take the post. Uh, we're going to have an option to do an increment. And you'll notice there that we have a string literal that is actually a regular expression. And we'll see how that ends up working. But if you think back to the previous slide where we had like sale slash endpoint slash GUID, that's what that W plus is going to capture for us. Um, we have a get on the sale, which you know, as it shows their API sales should return a list of transactions. And then uh, even though it's not something we normally use, we will end up deleting a transaction and we'll show how that works. And similarly to the uh, put, we're going to take our uh, unique ID identifier right off the URI. So security. Um, this was one of the others that we're calling here. And the couple things I guess I'd point out is, so the server has a pre-routing handler and there's also a post routing handler, uh, but you'll see it just takes a function pointer. So we're passing in a lambda. This is a pre or post routing, so it's going to be called every time that a request comes into the server. So in this case, uh, I have, you'll notice up there that I have this CID, which is a std atomic, which is just to make a connection ID. Um, I, we found it that logging wise to be able to help figure things out, to be able to track every connection ID coming in is generally a good thing uh, because it allows us to track for the various connections. If we have 20 people trying to call the API at the same time, we want to be able to track each individual connection through in the logging. So that request.setID with where we're incrementing the, the connection ID, I do need to say that that set ID is not in the HTTP lib by default. It is in the demo code that I have. It is flagged out in the version of HTTP lib that I'm providing. But that is something that we particularly add from our company because, like I said, it was a feature that we needed. Your HTTP request normally comes in as a const object. You're not going to be setting values in it. You're going to be reading values out of it. And so this was the uh, path of least resistance to get the feature that we needed. So we're just collecting off. Uh, if you look here, you'll see the request get header value. So the request is what's passed in. We can pull off the remote address or the user agent. And in this case, this is where we're using the host is banned. Um, and it'll turn around and look to see whether or not an IP address is banned. And if it is, it'll handle the response in one of two ways. So here. You know, when, we, when I was giving the examples earlier of posting or putting, and we get back our status as well as a message, uh, this is an example where we're setting the status. So result.status will equal code unauthorized. Uh, that's an enumeration that is there underneath response codes.h. Um, it's going to send back a 403 if the IP address wasn't allowed. Uh, that's all that that's doing there. Um, and you can see that basically I'm logging out uh, warning to the log with the request ID. The part that's important when you're using the pre and post routing handlers is this part here where we're returning HTTP lib handler response is being handled or unhandled. So if an IP was banned by returning the handler response of handled, it's going to tell HTTP lib to just term, not to, to give the response back and end the connection. We're not going to do any more processing with it because we're marking it as handled. If the IP wasn't banned, well, then the pre-routing is you know, not handling the connection, and we need to continue passing down the event chain. So as I had mentioned, there is a set post routing handler. So you can get things on both sides, pre and post. And incidentally, now I'm thinking about it, you know, when I was talking about the size of CPP HTTP lib and how it's changed, when we first started doing it, we had to write our first, the, back then we had to write our own pre-route and our own post route. And so that's where the nature of the library is still <coughs> the same as it was. Uh, it, it's just getting better. Um, but now things that we originally had to customize are just already in there by default. All right, so error handler. You can set an error handler. Um, same thing, you'll notice that we're passing in the reference to the server. The set error handler is just, again, using a lambda or a function pointer. Um, 
I think the code there is reasonably straightforward. We're just building out a nice logging string. If an error occurs, I want to collect all the information that I can. And error handling from an HTTP side, especially with RESTful interfaces, you don't want to just think about it from the uh, person that's actually sending you the request you expect. But we also think about it from the people that we don't want. You know, hackers turning around and trying to crawl every possible URL that you have on the server. Sometimes the way that you can find out the best to band or defend against that is to see what's coming in. And so uh, when it comes to logging out an error, we log out everything we can. OK, so the sale.cpp, this is where our API is that's actually going to handle the requests that are coming in. So this is a bit more of where we're handling the, the, the request from the JSON. So we had the API sale auth that would happen on a post. And so as you see here, we get the request and the response that's come in. Uh, the detail card info there, uh, we'll look at that structure in a minute. But you'll notice we have card info. So when we get a request in, part of that request is the body, same as I showed in as an example when we were doing the post. JSON parse will take that request body as a standard string. JSON parse turns that into a JSON object. That JSON object then gets turned into our card information object. And we'll look at how that happens in a moment. Um, the fact that I can take a JSON object and move it into an actual strong type was, was a bit of a learning experience. And, and I can come back to that. But, it was too tempting in the beginning to just pass around JSON everywhere as a string. You know, but the problem with passing around JSON everywhere as a string is that you know, if you don't know what type you're passing into something, that can be its own kind of a problem. So we turn around with our card information. Uh, I have a little utility that's going to create a GUID, a unique identifier for us, and it assigns it. Um, that data store is a standard string to a card information map with a mutex around it. I'm using that just in this demo app so that you can see if you were storing, adding, or deleting something, of course, you would probably have a lot more processing that you'd be doing on your own REST interfaces. So we create the object. We're going to log it. We're going to result uh, back with the status of OK. Um, here, I'm starting into the JSON result, and I'm passing in the card information object. So I'm basically going to return the data that was sent to me, although the good will be added. And again, the conversion will happen, and we'll see how that goes. So the response gets set content. Result.dump, that's a JSON object. Dot dump turns it back to a string. And content type, uh, you can see from the const expert up there is the application JSON. So a lot of this ends up going back to more HTTP items where you're setting your content type whenever you're you know, responding back. But on most RESTful interfaces, we almost never use anything else but application JSON because at least in our work, that's everything that's going back and forth is just JSON. So this is the card info, uh, card info structure. Pretty straightforward, just some regular data types there. Uh, the part that we really want to end up looking at at the bottom is this from JSON and to JSON. So from JSON, we're going to take const JSON object, and we'll take a reference to a card info. The to JSON uh, does just the flip of that. And this is what those look like. So when we pass in the references, so the from JSON, we're going to turn around and crawl through the actual JSON value and extract out the different items. You'll notice that I use j.value here because in this case, if there was anything that was wrong in the key, I will get a default initialization. So at points in the beginning when I was looking at the config, you saw that we sometimes use dot at. Dot add is fine if you know the data that you're getting in there. So for example, with the config, when I do a dot add on the port, you know, I expect that to be a number. I'm the one that put it in there. If it's not, uh, that's going to be the way that is. I'll, I can fix that. But if it's data that someone's passing into me, if it comes in as the wrong type, I want to make sure that I'm at least keeping my default value there. The flip side is the to JSON will write it back out. So, this is how the serialization with the nloman library works. Um, you don't have to write it out like this. You can actually get rid of the boilerplate uh, with a macro that they have defined in there. 
we still use the boilerplate because although this example isn't a bunch of conversions in it, for our own work, we end up doing more than that. However, if all you're doing is straight conversions, you can use the macro and remove the boilerplate. All right, so this is the increment uh, method for the sale API. Um, so you'll see some similar things here where we're parsing the body uh, and converting it. The main thing that I point out that's different here is we've got this auto GUID request.matches1. So if you'll remember up here in the top, you'll see that we have the server. Um, you know, this was the URI that we're using, which is based on a regular expression. And so you can turn around and call matches on the request that came in to get the data out of that uh, W plus there, which is just going to grab a word. So with that, we'll go to our data store and look the item up. Um, data store get returns an optional, which is why I'm saying, you know, does it have a value? If it does, we're just doing a little bit of testing uh, here in this point. And then we're going to turn around and set our tip amount and save that out. If for some reason it didn't find a value, then transactions not found. And you'll notice that there's a difference. If we find the item, we're going to send back a status of OK. If we don't find the item, we're going to send back an internal service error. And either way, we will return back the uh, string and the content type. All right, so that's the server side. Um, the HTTP lib on the client side is actually pretty simple. And so this is actually down here, you'll notice under, tor uh, under test, we have this client.cpp. Uh, we're using the same detail credit card, of course. Uh, we have a few values that are set up top. But in essence, we have the HTTP lib client. Uh, you're going to initialize that with where you want it to connect to from a server standpoint, the first half of the URI. And then for our purposes here, we're just going to loop through um, for however many tests that we wanted to do, uh, doing a default construction of the card info with just some regular values. We'll do a post. And here you see that we're passing in the, the CLI object that we created above um, with the particular body that we want, which is the C1. We will turn around and get back whatever the server gives us and put it into C2. We will then do the test of put, which will then do a put test, calling the URI for put. And then we're going to sleep for a little bit of time. This way, when I run the demo, it doesn't scroll by so fast that you can't see it. Um, we'll do a test run of get. So again, we'll pass in the CLI. And we'll look at each one of these methods in a second. And then finally, we're going to go through and remove them. So the test of the post. So Again, we're passing in the reference to the client. Uh, and then similar to how the HTTP lib server side works, you'll end up using the post method, pass in the, uh, the endpoint that you want it to connect to. The payload.dump, this is a similar thing that we've seen before. .dump ends up returning the standard string for you for a JSON object, um, and then the content type. What we get back? In the response, we're parsing it out and we're assigning it back to card info. We log some information out. So in general, this is where I'm saying the client itself uh, from the HTTP lib is pretty simple to use. Um, it is a blocking client. Uh, that's where I'm like, the main thing that we've ever used it for is testing this way. I will say if you need speed on a client, aside from the async, we have found that curl is actually a lot faster than this library. Um, but from an ease of use, it's, I'd much rather do a client post this way than using uh, curl with C++. Yes? Why have you got a trailing return type in the post test post? Honestly, because I got tired of seeing the line come up and claim tidy. <laughs> um, OK, so test put. Uh, similar, we're going to take, and we've, we're calling the, the endpoint. You see that we're going to pass in the GUID. This GUID is actually coming from our previous post. And so we'll see how that ends up working, uh, logging it out. So there's a lot of this boilerplate that's the same. I think you can see that there. Um, so similarly now, we look at the get. We're going to make a get call. Git is actually going to try to get us a list of all the transactions we sent in. And then remove 
no payload, which I guess is the thing that I would point out there, client delete, and we're just passing in the path that we're gonna delete, which in this case again is sale void and the GUID. All right, and so the thing that most people don't like to do, we'll do a demo. So, we start the server up, it's binding to any address that I have available. As you can see, we're getting our idle point. This middle section right here is just watching the log. So we run the functional test, and you're seeing each one of the items as it goes through. It does its put, it does its update, it does its store, and it deletes them back out. So all of the code that's there, if you end up wanting to see, uh, like I said, you'll be able to pull out and look at the code and, and run it and play with it however you like. The code on the slides might be a little different, but the code that's actually checked in does work and run. All right, so singleton or, inject, or injection, and I can, Pete, Pete's, Pete's grinning because he's like, yeah, you shouldn't have a singleton. And so our logger class is still singleton-ish. Um, the logger class that you're gonna find in there is, is one that has not been updated in a while. Uh, that wasn't the focus on the talk. I wanted to talk more about the HTTP, the JSON and stuff. Um, but I will say that for us, the logger being the way it is um, works because at any point I can do that get logger. It gets me the log. I can write the details out. Uh, generally interleaving and things like that aren't an issue for us. Um, when you saw where I was taking the uh, host object and actually passing that through to the thread, there's a lot of areas in our code where I'd originally found we had static globals that would be for a configuration of one application to talk to the next. And of course the problem there becomes um, what happens if somebody else tries to change that configuration? You know, we're a small team. We don't walk too much over each other's items, but it was still an issue. And so I did find that, you know, moving to doing injection uh, helped solve some of those problems. Um, doing injection, especially there where it becomes a host config, was important because you're binding to an IP address. You probably don't want someone reloading your config at that point in time. However, what I am still working with is that we have some spots where uh, we have, uh, you know, one app may talk to another and that dynamically can change. And the one thing that is in the app class that we have is our configurations, if you change the file out from under it, it will dynamically reload in the application. Um, and so we use injection, dependency injection where we can. Um, so again, to the logger point, the one that's in the GitHub repository, we haven't touched in a while, um, but I was gonna say, I don't know about anybody else, but I really like Clang Tidy more than almost the AI stuff because going down this list, even though it gives me a trailing return type, I try to clean up the noise. Um, so this here is just talking a little bit more about where I was saying with the injection. Uh, I did find that, you know, to get rid of the non-cons globally accessible is that we would get injection was was my preferred solution so i did avoid the singletons in that option because another coworker was like you can do injection or you can do a singleton so i did think of pete that time um, bridging with solid type so if you look here you know we have a piece of json that's on the left and what i'm trying to point out is you know there's config timers monitor. So I'm trying to show that with the way the JSON works, you can almost do it like key-based array access, right? And so that's where I was saying, uh, we really had a thing for a while where as we first started using JSON, it's like, well, heck, these are just strings. We can just pass them everywhere. There's, there's no need to, to turn around and make types out of it because we can just update the JSON. Um, but of course, the problem there becomes you don't really know what you have because you're just passing a string everywhere. And so anytime that we get the chance that we're using JSON, we immediately try to convert it to a strong type so that then we're working with a strong type and convert back and forth. So, uh, and this is just reiterating that because you can see that using the from JSON and to JSONs, getting your strong type out is, is just a safer way to work with it. So, in the end, both of these libraries, you know, from a speed and performance point of view, last 10 months, 
over $100 billion and 700 million transactions through our systems. And we literally can go 10, 15 times more than that with the code that we currently have without doing optimizations. Um, so we have lots of room to grow. These two libraries with their you know, minimal dependencies, uh, easy to use, they were easy to integrate, and that's why even after four years we're still using them. So if you need to make a RESTful interface and you're looking for something quick and easy uh, to be able to do that, I recommend both of them. Uh, making RESTful interfaces with C++, if, to me this has made it simple. Uh, you know, as I was preparing for the talk, I've seen other libraries where people have talked about lithium and a few others, and I'll definitely start looking at new things. However, you know, when you have something that's working for you, trading it out isn't something I always want to consider. Um, the libraries are cross-platform, they're efficient. JSON, I mean, you can pass everything around that you need. We have JSON that goes between Go, C++, and just about any other language. It makes interoperability between languages simple. Um, and then, you know, useful design that doesn't paint you into a corner. Uh, that's that part where, when it comes to like using strong types instead of JSON and passing it around, trying to use good design practices that way. Uh, there on the bottom, you see that we have the URL. And there it is again. And thank you. Any questions? Uh, yeah. Have you ever uh, considered JSON sellable uh, validation? No. No. Uh, most of the so when it when it comes to our so. When I make the, the API that I've made for credit card transactions, we have a very you know, strict API. It's well documented. Um, in half the cases, if it's a merchant machine that's sending it to me, that's an Android machine that somebody is writing the development on. We have a reasonable amount of control. Um, when we have uh, the APIs that are being accessed, we're more likely to deny a transaction if it looks like anything's off when it comes in, then accept it. Yeah. But I, I will have to look at that. That's something I need to consider. Yeah. Anything else? Yes. How do you handle JSON parsing errors? So JSON parsing errors, generally we wrap with an exception. Uh, we don't use exceptions lightly, and we don't normally have them. More often than not, that's where I was showing that I use like the value tag, and I'll default initialize something. So that's specifically, you know, where I was doing the at in the config, uh, if I was really worried about having a parsing error, I would wrap the at using a, an exception. But in general, we use the value now, and then just default construct. And then I'll turn around and do a data check to say, hey, I needed this value. It's not here. Why isn't it here? And then you know, that's the part where I was showing we do a lot of logging, because then I can go back based on all the transaction IDs and literally track through every step of a transaction to find why. Yeah. Anything else? Yes? When setting up the REST API, uh, the decision will to put the parameters as part of the URI or in the JSON body. Uh, seems uh, arbitrary. Arbitrary. <laughs> so we haven't noticed a performance impact on it. When we came to making the API for where we are asking for them to give us the the GUID or the transaction ID in the URI, um, some cases we're doing that from. So if I ask somebody to void a transaction, for example, I'm going to ask them just to give me that. Uh, on the URI. Is the regular, regular expression parsing going to cost more in time than actually passing it in on the body? It's not been something that we've had to measure the performance on. However, from an ease of use to tell a client, OK, you're going to void. You're just going to pass in the good right after the, the path. That's been easier to use and, and, and less support calls than um, the other. There are times, though, where we'll do both. Like, we have some parts of our API where you can pass that GUID either on the URI or inside of the body, and we'll take either. So I think that's more of just design decision. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir? You're running metrics on 
your production data. In other words, any of the SRE type metrics, you know, throughput, latency, and see if you're starting to cap out, or you're just going to wait for it to happen. Actually. No, we do we do run metrics to see where we're capping out, and to that part, that's where. Um, in some cases, we found that things like curl when we're making client calls are faster, and we've turned around and moved to that. Um, but yes, no, we do run metrics, which is why I'm saying that we know that we have the capability with where we're currently at to do 10 times more transactions than where we are. I don't, I, I'm getting the impression that I didn't answer where you were going. No, that's okay. good enough answer. Do you have any idea what your uh, you know, bad request rate is? In other words, where you have to maybe throw exceptions or say that the operation's ill-formed? It's low. On, on the particular APIs that I wrote, it's low because of that fact that, like I said, generally, so we have what they call a terminal group, and that's that part where when you're tapping your card, you know, there's a whole level of software that is in that terminal that I didn't write, that a different group did. They're actually doing all kinds of error checking on their end to make sure that the transaction is mostly valid or should be valid before it gets sent to me. About the only time that we reach those kinds of error rates is, you know, so I said we were what they call an acquiring processor because we talk to banks. But sometimes you'll have a new company starting up that wants to be a merchant processor, and so they will process through us. And in that case, yes, I do sometimes see more error rates because as they're trying to ramp up taking transactions, we have to work closely with them to make sure that they're sending us data in the proper formats. But this is one thing where I will say, like, the one part I love about my job is I have the best clients in the world because for the most part, that machine doesn't complain. It doesn't call me in the middle of the night. If it ever goes down, we hear about it until no end because you know nobody wants to go to the store, especially on Christmas, and swipe their credit card and not be able to get the gift for whoever they're purchasing it for. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you.